morning dear participants and welcome to this module. In the previous module we have discussed how the feminist thought has gradually emerged. From the days of essentialist arguments, it has started to incorporate the variations based on culture and later on it moved towards indeterminacies. The impact of postmodernist philosophy has also changed the way in which the feminists were looking at the world outside them. In this context, today we would continue our discussion and highlight the gender philosophy as such. How does the discipline of gender study emerges? What are the key concepts in it? And how is it different or similar to the feminist ideology? The contemporary understanding of gender studies has been a result of various interdisciplinary disciplines. Studies in the area of postmodernism, culture studies, feminism, postcolonial studies, etc., sensitize the people towards the fact that gender studies are also needed because it is linked with the socio political movements as well as the cultural representation of identity. Gender as such is a much contested concept, it is slippery and as well as it is obligatory. And there are immense and heterogeneous possibilities for the interpretation of the term. Cora Kaplan has termed gender as a site of unease rather than a site of agreement. As a grammatical category, we find that gender has existed in every language and the masculine form has been treated as the linguistic norm. Masculine form is generic and feminine form is a variant in all the languages, introducing a component of weakness that women are somehow less than men in terms of power and in terms of authority. For example, if we look at these terms, master and mistress, poet and poetess, lord and lady, and then the list can be continued further. When we use the word master in any language, we find that it denotes unconditioned authority over something. On the other hand, the term mistress is always a dilution of this authority as if this is the exercise of the authority which has been given over by the master. At the same time, we find that the feminine terms unlike the generic masculine terms are always incorporated with demeaning connotations. For example, the term mistress was also used around the second world war for a brothel keeper. The same differences we can find in poet and poetess. Poetess is a variation, it is not the norm. Similarly, lord and lady, whereas lord suggests again like master an unquestioned authority and a social stature, lady is just a woman. So, we find that the dilution of authority is always inbuilt in the social connotations, in the cultural connotations, the way the language is used the world over. So, we find that the socio cultural and psychological meanings are imposed upon biological sexual identity and language, as we have seen in our earlier discussions of post modernist debates, also plays a significant role in it. The studies of gender became important because a woman centered investigation was somehow not suitable anymore for the society and studies of gender related objects incorporate not only women, but they also study man, the transgender also. Etymologically, the word gender has been derived from Latin word genus. Its origin is also traced to the Middle English gender, a loan word from Norman conquest era Old French and both words mean kind or type. Their derivation in turn can be traced to Proto-Indian European root gen which is also the source of English words like kin, kind, king, etc. A survey of the literary usage of the word suggests that by the time we were entering 14th century, the word had come to refer to femininity and masculinity as a type particularly in religious texts. It was around 1950s that the feminist critics had started to talk about the impact of culture in defining gender and clearly differentiating between sex and gender. The contribution of three feminist critics is particularly to be noted in the context of the emergence of gender theories 
and they are Butler, Chaudhry and Barbara Turner who critically assessed existing perceptions on gender, gender roles, sex. They also told us that after an analytical understanding, these concepts entail a clear understanding of the interactional processes which are involved in the creation of gender as well as in the creation of a gendered person in society. These critics argue that it is our sense of gender identity and our perception of gender role which we try to enact in our lives which becomes important in the overall identity formation. Chaudhry has rightly remarked and I quote, we cannot step out of being gendered and sexed that is who we are. We do not have any separate self apart from our engendering. So, the idea that gender conditioning is important for personality formation gradually was extended to incorporate the social conditioning, the cultural conditioning of men and transgender and thereby we find that the concept of gender has emerged. A very interesting idea of gender theories is that they talk not only about the difference, but they also talk about power. The gender critics think that gender is imposed by forces which are hidden as biological, mythical, cultural, racial, religious and so on different types of arguments. It is also promoted by media and popular culture as we would see in another uh, module. So, reading with gender on our agenda somehow is an enabling factor for the reader also as well as it envisages a proactive reading of the text on the part of the reader. So, reading with gender on the agenda involves not only the writer but also the reader because it would require an active process of imagination and interpretation. It alerts the reader to the need to look beyond the limiting possibilities of textual decoding and encouraging the reader to find out what are the gender related issues beyond the regular critical norms. It is important here to refer to three critics, Irigeri, Helen Siksu and Julia Kistriva. These writers have put forward theories of feminine difference as a value and rejecting the male symbolic order. They oppose the concept of a universal and neutral human nature as it sets masculine values as a standard promoting gendered hierarchies and gendered binaries. Inner works like a Speculum of the Other Woman published in 1985 and This Sex Which Is Not One published in 1987, Irigeri has posited that women have been constructed as other of men in the western thought. Universalizing the masculine according to these critics implies setting it as a norm which results in the subordination not only of women, but also of the transgender. So, we find that whereas the previous feminist thinkers used to think that the concept of cultural conditioning puts women only in a subordinate place, these critics Irigeri, Helen Siksu, Julia Kristeva and several other influenced by them started to talk about the subordination of the transgender and herein we find is the quintessence of the development of masculinity studies as well as the queer studies also. So, they have put forward theories of feminine difference as a value rejecting the masculinity supremacy and thus subverting the conventional norms. These philosophers have combined psychoanalysis and linguistics in a post structuralist argument. Irigeri has posited that the women have been constructed as a spectacular other of man in western discourse as we have seen earlier and she wants to create a new language to, escu to escape the masculine rule bound and rigidified language. She seeks to uncover a feminine order of meaning and then Irigeri also argues that the Freudian theory of sexuality and sexual pleasure had also initially believed in the gender binary, in the traditional binary and therefore, she suggests that the conventional gendered supremacy of men has dominated the linguistic modes of expression too and create her own writing favoring the images and metaphors of fluidity, dynamism polysemy and plurality which she engages with feminine order and then she also suggests that women should reject the masculine 
way of expression that is metaphors which are based on unity, monologism, stability and fixity. So, Irigiri wants to create a new language in order to escape the masculine rule bound and rigidified language which in her opinion would pave way for gender equality. They also have gone ahead and say that gender and power structure each other. This was their main contribution and then they have started to talk about power hierarchies and thus they have paved the way of masculinities and queer theories also. And that is why they want that women have to be made more visible so that gender and power hierarchy can also be challenged. Helen Sixu like Irigiri has also wanted to create a different language which represents the feminine. She wants to also attempt to discover a writing which is fluid, transgressive and beyond binary systems of logic and thereby attempting to establish equality and defy gender hierarchies. She has also commented that heterosexuality in our society is a compromise formation, a sexual orientation which has been made primary in the western culture since the 19th century. The emphasis of Irigiri as well as Helen Sixu over the different ways in which language is used by men and women in our culture is taken further by gender critics and they have also studied the impact of these different cultural processes in the way women use language not only in their literary writings but also in different types of media. In our discussions on media we would see how it is said that women normally use more hedges, more indirect way of expression even in their non-literary writings. And therefore, these post-feminist critics have criticized the Freudian theories. Sixu further combines power with gendered categories and in their definition of culture, they have started to talk about the presentation of gender that is men, women and transgender in various cultural products. Culturally encouraged fairy tales, myths, movies and books constitute sexual fantasies through language which are later on adopted at an individual level to invent and solidify personal myths regarding gender and gender roles. Thus notions of sexual attraction as well as what constitutes attractiveness are constructed in, his, in a historical manner and they may have cross cultural connotations also but the impact of particular culture is always visible on them. Somehow these post feminist critics say that somehow literary connotations and literary productions have taken up heterosexuality as a norm thus abetting gendered norms in societal groups. Chaudhry also comments that in all depictions of homosexuality references are made specifically to sexuality, sexual choice, fantasy, eroticization and desire as far as the accounts of homosexuality are concerned. Whereas in all accounts of heterosexuality, similar acts are shown as being or meaning something more than the mere act of sex and therefore the society has given a particular dominance to heterosexuality. Feminists also analyze literary text and evince that the contemporary norms of gender structure man-woman relationship in such a manner that it tends to subordinate and devalue not only women but also the transgender. They have also said that sexuality is central to psychoanalysis but in the conventional studies of psychoanalysis dominated by Freud in the beginning of the 20th century, it has accepted the gendered binaries and therefore has not advanced our understanding of hetero as well as homosexuality. At this particular point, it is important to quote the work of Sedgwick and Judith Halberstam. They have criticized the apparent sexual politics which decides the gender preferences in one's behavior and attitudes and foreground the argument that the realms of genders are variable. They also say that the centrality of sexuality for every issue of gender has to be accepted as it molds among other aspects power relations also. So, we find that these philosophers have talked about the inherent relationship between gender, gender roles and power relations which govern different relationships. Eve Sajwick has particularly talked about the economic relationships. In her article between men, 
Sedgwick has quoted Catherine McKinnon's argument in support of her ideas that socially femaleness means femininity, which in turn means attractiveness to men, which in turn means sexual attractiveness, which in turn means sexual availability on male terms. So, the idea of these post feminist critics is to suggest that wherever femininity is constructed, it is related within heterosexual relationship with certain type of availability on sexual terms. She has also incorporated a detailed analysis of the famous novel Gone with the Wind from this perspective. So, we see that gender roles and identities are constructed by the intersection of domination and sexuality. Whereas, the second wave feminist had highlighted the artificiality of gender, postmodernist thinkers have brought into consideration the interdeterminacy of gender. Though meanings may vary with every culture, a sex gender system is always interconnected with political and economic factors in every part of our globe. It can be said therefore, that the cultural construction of sex into gender and the asymmetry that is fundamentally present in all gender systems cross culturally are the reasons of social inequality. The concept of gender has also tried to analyze the way women have to express themselves particularly in literature and literary works within a particular version of creativity which has been defined and modulated by men. So, women writers have to adjust their creativity within a male vision of creativity. So, women have to negotiate with the male fantasies of the female instead of writing their own fantasies in terms of any particular affair or desire, they have to trust the male versions of the female fantasies which were either of the submissive angel or that of an aggressive monster. Taking these arguments further, I would like to introduce two terms, gender as technology and gender as performance. The idea of gender as technology was given initially by De Lauretis. She has said that gender is a representation and the representation of gender is its construction. And she also says that the western art and the high culture is the engraving of the history of the gender construction. She also says that the construction of gender goes on not only in palpable social organizations where it can be seen easily, but also in subtle manner in other organizations where one does not expect it to work. Echoing the argument of Louis Althusser, borrowing the phrase of ideological state apparatus from Althusser, she says that the concept of gender works not only in family, workplace and media where it is more apparent, but also it works in those places of academy, in avant-garde artistic practices and radical theories where one does not normally expect it to exist. So, this technology of gender has a prevalent impact on our psyche. Another idea of gender as a performance was given by Judith Butler in her famous book Gender Trouble published in 1990. These two ideas had a very important impact on the development of gender theories and later on on the development of masculinity studies and the queer studies also. So, Butler has suggested that gender is a continuous process. It is something which we do rather than we are. She also negates the common assumption that sex, gender and sexuality are relational that is a biological female is expected to adopt and display culturally accepted feminine traits in a heteronormative world. She claims that gender as such is unnatural and there is no necessary or corresponding relationship between one's body and gender. She says that gender is a choice and a reorganization of preferences and choices. She also suggests that a person cannot be a free agent in selecting one's gender. Because she thinks that such an act of free choice is impossible as we are already conditioned by restrictive gender norms of the society, the family etcetera of which we are a part. Another aspect of gender theories has also been influenced by this line of argument which was presented by Gilbert and Gabar in their book The Mad Woman in the Attic 
published in 1979, where they have felt that the mad woman image in most of the 19th century fiction written by women writers represented their double, the schizophrenia of authorship and the anxiety of creation and they suggested that women writers have to go beyond it if they actually have to participate in the literary production. So, we find that critics like Irigeri, Helen Sixu, Juliet but Butler etcetera have attempted to discover a writing, a process of writing which is fluid, transgressive and beyond binary systems of logic and thereby they hope to establish equality and defy gendered hierarchies in the system. To some of we can say that gender critics feel that gender roles are delineated by behavioral expectations and norms and once the individuals know these expectations and norms, they can try to adopt behaviors that project the gender they wish to portray. However, as Butler had said, this desire or this choice is not exactly independent, it is often also very much conditioned. So, there are specific behaviors and norms associated with genders, just like there are lines and movements associated with each character in a play. Adopting the behaviors and norms of a gender leads to the perception that someone belongs to that particular category of gender. So, gender roles unlike sex are mutable, they can change because one can always choose to adopt a different gender role. So, gender is not however, as simple as just choosing a role to play but is influenced by parents, by peers, by the culture, the society, the workplace. At the same time, the phenomenon of gender has a multi-layered connotation. It is bodily, psychological and physiological features also and gender and power structures cannot be easily separated. They are interdependent and define each other in every society. Notion of gender is formed, framed and congealed into forms which appear to be natural and permanent by discourses which are also create patriarchal power structure. And when we talk of discourses which create patriarchal power structures etcetera, the meta narratives, we find that the discussion of media becomes a natural corollary of this discussion. So, gender studies are symmetrical, they study men as well as transgender. They recognize that the existing structure of men and women relationship tends to devalue and subordinate not only women, but they also marginalize many men who cannot conform to the gender norms given to men also in the society. After this discussion, we find that our gender identity is a compulsory facet as suggested by the gender theorists. So, individually and collectively a gender identity is created. Now, whenever we talk of creation, we will have to refer to Laureate's word of gender as a technology. So, in the next part of our discussion, we would see what are the different ways in which gender theorists feel the concept of gender is constructed at an individual as well as at a collective level. Major theories about construction of gender are listed here and I would take them up briefly one by one. Many of them we have already referred to during the course of our discussion. The first theory is biological difference theory which suggests that anatomy is destiny. We have discussed it in detail in our discussions in the first phase of feminist theory. This theory and this belief gives little consideration to the fact that there is a wide variety of behaviors among members of each sex and also there is a wide variety in how masculinity and femininity relate to each other in different settings. However, we find that it is not uncommon to witness newspaper or magazine articles routinely quoting scientific studies to show how the difference between men and women lies hidden somewhere in the body, often brain. It is interesting to quote a particular study by Simone Baron Cohen, which was published in 2003. The title of the book is The Essential Difference Men, Women and the Extreme Male Brain. Cohen is a professor of developmental psychology at Cambridge and his thesis can be put summarily as stating that the female brain is predominantly hardwired for empathy 
the male brain is predominantly hardwired for understanding and building systems. So, these are the arguments which the feminist critics in the first phase and also during the early second phase have countered. To put it in different ways, these theorists believe that the male frame of mind is different from the female frame of mind in the sense that the former is geared towards analysis of a system, whereas the female approach is connected with readings of natural beings, it is more concerned with empathetic behavior. However, this view of natural difference is difficult to support as notions of appropriate gender behavior as we have seen during our discussions are not static, but they differ over time between ethnic and cultural groups and even between and within families. Psychodynamic theories emphasize inner psychic conflicts of children instead of external pressure. They talk about Freudian concepts of Oedipal conflict, the penis envy, the electro conflict etcetera and suggest that on the basis of these psychological conflicts, gender roles are defined by children at a very early age of their development. Cognitive developmental theories emphasize the early stages of mental development. A major thinker Lawrence Kohelberg has suggested that children are normally led, the phrase he has used is almost inevitably. So, he says that children are almost inevitably led by their own cognitive process to choose gender as the organizing principle for social rule that govern their own behavior as well as the behavior of the peers. So, he has associated the internalization of gender roles by a child as a process of the cognitive development during the early ages of life. Socialization of social learning theories as the very title suggests emphasize the influence of culture over the individual. How culture influences differing learning environments especially of children and also sometimes of adults as well. And therefore, these different learning environments promote different type of perceptions for gender. For example, there are rewards for gender appropriate behaviors which is, which is supported by the society. There is a criticism or even a punishment for gender inappropriate behavior by the peers as well as by the adults. So, we find that imitation of models and examples which young children see around them in the society becomes effective because a gender appropriate behavior is rewarded and a gender inappropriate behavior is ridiculed and even punished. Gender schema theories merge cognitive developmental aspects with social learning theory. Schemas are internal cognitive networks which are shaped by socialization that organize and guide individual perceptions. Gender schemas are cognitive networks associated with concepts of masculine and feminine and highly gender schematic individuals tend to organize many of their thoughts, perceptions, evaluations and actions according to gender stereotypes and symbols. Research also shows that by the time a child is of 3 years old, the child has started to learn the figurative or metaphorical meanings of gender. Children learn an underlying framework for understanding the nature of masculine and feminine that often depends on the specific models appearing in their environment, but at the same time it does it may also not depend on them. So, they may learn from models who are present in their immediate environment, but at the same time they may leave them aside and may learn from certain other models which are not available to them in their immediate environment. Social structure or situational theories emphasize the constraints which the different structures of the society put on children and adult. The fact that men and women are in different and in unequal positions in different social structures often result into a conditioning of gender in very subtle manner. For example, people may also sometimes consciously discriminate against people or sometimes they may unconsciously discriminate against certain things. So, it may also be a possible that people themselves may not be aware that they are being discriminatory on the basis of gender patterns. So, the structural con constraints condition men and women sometimes to consciously discriminate against 
some behavior, but sometimes it may also happen that they themselves are not aware of this discrimination. So, it becomes quite difficult to prove that discrimination has occurred because for someone it may be a case of discrimination, whereas for some people this discrimination may be taking place at an unconscious level and they may not even be aware of conducting it. Identity construction theories emphasize the individual's personal and conscious commitment to a specific image of self and they encourage us to think of gender like a role in a play. They say that there are specific behaviors and norms associated with gender just like there are lines and movements with each other which each character has to play and it reminds us of J Judith Butler's argument. Adopting the behaviors and norms of a gender leads to the perception that someone belongs to that gender category. So, these theories emphasize individuals personal and conscious commitment to a specific self image. They think that according to one's preferred self image, a person would be able to choose a particular type of behavior like one may choose certain lines in a play. Enculturated lens theory propounded by Sandra Bain includes all these theories which we have talked about and they also emphasize the social and historical context which contains the lenses of gender. According to Sandra Bem, there are two key enculturation processes that are constantly linked and working together. The institutional programming of the individual's daily experience into the default options or the historically pre-cut grooves for that particular time and place are different markedly for men and women. So, her idea is that people are encouraged, young girls and boys are encouraged to follow the pre-cut grooves as far as the gender norms and gender appropriate behavior is concerned. The transmission of implicit lessons or meta messages about what lenses the culture uses to organize social reality are also important because they include the idea that the distinction between male and female, masculine and feminine is extremely important and has to be preserved. So, we have seen that feminist and gender theories oppose culture, a culture which is based on control of women, they want to transform the society and they feel that at the same time that the concept of a single man and woman in terms of their experiences is polemical and they suggest that the plurality has to be understood. They also feel that the traditional conventional patriarchal culture is crowded with over determinations of traditional male supremacy and they want to change the society. It is also a dynamic and progressive approach and I would like to conclude the discussion by quoting from Toril May, echoing the idea of Karl Marx that in an ideal society the state will wither away. She also presents a utopian vision before us and says that in a non-sexist, non-patriarchal society, feminism will no longer exist. So, these ideas suggest that feminism as an ideology, feminism as a movement as well as gender theories are there because the patriarchal culture has necessitated it. And once the non, this patriarchal culture is abolished, perhaps the feminism as well as the gender theories will not be needed by us. Thank you.